Hello, and welcome to the second talk in the Mathematical and Computational Ophthalmology seminar series. My name's Paul Roberts, and I'm a Centre Fellow at the Centre for Systems Modelling and Quantitative Biomedicine at the University of Birmingham, where I work in the mathematical modelling of the eye. I'm the creator and host of this seminar series, together with David Crabb, who heads the Crabb Lab at City University of London, and Phil Luthert, a Professor of Pathology at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. This seminar series aims to showcase research in mathematical and computational ophthalmology to the broader ophthalmological, vision science, medical, mathematical and computational communities, raising awareness of the exciting research being conducted in the field and encouraging future work in this area. Do subscribe to this YouTube channel if you'd like to keep up to date on the past and future talks. These are also listed on our worldwide page, the link to which can be found below in the About section of this YouTube channel. And our thanks go to Worldwide for instigating this platform for sharing scientific research. Before introducing our speaker, Aaron Lee, I have an exciting announcement to make. David Crabb, Phil Luthert and I are guest editing a special issue on mathematical and computational ophthalmology in the journal Investigative Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, or IOVS. It's our hope that this issue will serve to showcase research in mathematical and computational ophthalmology to the broader medical, experimental and quantitative communities, raising the profile of the field and promoting the research of those working within it. We welcome submissions of original research applying quantitative methods to examine any aspect of visual system structure or function. The deadline for submission is the 1st of December of this year, 2023. All submissions will be peer reviewed and publication fees will apply to papers that are accepted. A link to the IOVS special issue advert can be found below in the about section of this YouTube channel. This seminar series got off to a great start last month, focusing on mathematical ophthalmology with an inaugural talk from Robert Linsenmeyer on mathematical and experimental approaches to retinal oxygenation. The recording for which can be found below on our YouTube playlist. This week, we're switching to computational ophthalmology with our speaker, Aaron Lee, a world leader in the field. If you'd like to ask Aaron a question, then please do send these in via the YouTube chat, both during and after the talk. The talk will last for about 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes for Q&A, in which I will relay your questions to Aaron. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Aaron Lee. Aaron is an associate professor and vitreoretinal surgeon in the University of Washington Department of Ophthalmology and the recent recipient of the C. Dan and Irene Hunter Endowed Professorship. He completed his undergraduate degree at Harvard University and his medical training at Washington University in St. Louis. He chairs the American Academy of Ophthalmology Information Technology Steering Committee and serves as an associate editor for both translational vision science and technology and ophthalmology science as well as being the edit on the editorial board for the American Journal of Ophthalmology and Nature Scientific Reports. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts and is known as a leader in the field of artificial intelligence and ophthalmology. Aaron's research is focused on the translation of novel computational techniques in machine learning to uncover new disease associations and mechanisms from routine clinical data, including electronic health records and imaging. So I'll hand over now to Aaron to present his talk entitled Deep Learning Applications in Ophthalmology. Aaron. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen here. All right. Uh, so uh, it gives me great pleasure and it's an honor to um, be part of this uh, seminar series. Um, these are my financial disclosures. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving an introduction um, into, you know, the the field uh, sort of at large for uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning in particular, uh, and then uh, a little bit about ophthalmology as a clinical field and as a field for data science. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll kind of go through our journey uh, of how we ended up um, in uh, doing the kind of research uh, we do today. Uh, so I hope, you know, everyone uh, listening kind of knows that we are firmly living in this era of uh, big data and machine learning. Um, everything that we do, uh, you know, with our phones or email, um, uh, any kind of um, ad that we see uh, on the Internet is being powered by uh, powerful machine learning algorithms that uh, drive the content that we see and interact with uh, on a, a minute to minute basis today. 
Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that sort of happened uh, in the past, um, you know, a couple of decades uh, is the birth of a new uh, uh, set of techniques um, in machine learning known as deep learning. And deep learning really sort of came um, uh, uh, on uh, around around the birth of AlexNet uh, during a, uh, a, a, a challenge, a computer vision challenge known as ImageNet. And before AlexNet, you know, the state of the art performance was getting, you know, about one in four incorrect um, on recognizing a, a, a certain kind of object in, in a picture um, uh, from the natural world. Uh, but what you can see that happened sort of rapidly after uh, deep learning um, came into the, uh, the picture um, is that the performance of these models today now, um, you know, sur surpass the human error rate. Uh, and if you put that sort of side by side uh, by the um, number of publications on PubMed uh, that use, you know, medical, um, you know, uh, machine learning, sorry, that uses uh, uh, AI or deep learning uh, with medical education or training, you can see that there's this uh, spike that, uh, you know, kind of goes across the board um, with all sort of medical literature uh, that it really starts around, you know, 2015, 2016. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the uh, translation of, of new techniques uh, from computer science into the medical field, it was only about uh, two or three years, and it's really kind of taken off since then. Um, and what's uh, one of the reasons why uh, this is happening, you know, not just uh, in the field of medicine, but, you know, across the entire uh, human society with everything from, you know, uh, internet algorithms to self-driving cars uh, uh, is that, uh, we are living at a time where there's a convergence of both the the, the computer hardware and, and architecture that's needed to host um, and hold large data sets, uh, along with the AI methods uh, that can take advantage of them. Uh, and so we're really living in sort of what, you know, people are calling the fourth industrial revolution uh, today. Um, and I always like to sort of disambiguate uh, these terms because I always see in the news media that people often interchange these terms, um, uh, uh, but uh, they, they do have uh, definitions and meaning. Uh, so the field of uh, artificial intelligence is um, actually quite old. Uh, it's as old as, you know, really uh, the era of uh, modern computing. Um, and within uh, AI, there's a subfield known as machine learning. Uh, and within machine learning, there's a subfield uh, known as deep learning. So basically, you know, all deep learning is AI, but not all AI is deep learning. And what is deep learning? Well, it's sort of an extension of uh, uh, traditional artificial neural networks or a multi-layer perceptron network that uh, used about one to three fully connected layers uh, to try and mimic, you know, the biologic um, uh, way that our brains sort of function. Um, but what uh, sort of uh, what was a major limitation here um, is that they, uh, it, at the time in the 90s when these were very popular, uh, you couldn't really extend them beyond um, one to three layers. Uh, so there's, in my opinion, sort of four advances that happened around you know 2014 or so uh, that led to the birth or the sort of the big bang of uh, of, of deep learning. Uh, first, it was the realization that uh, graphics cards or GPUs could be used uh, for something more useful than playing computer games. Um, it turned out. Uh, that the uh, mathematics behind rotating three-dimensional polygons uh, was really just linear algebra. And if you looked at uh, the math behind, uh, you know, machine learning, it could just be turned into linear algebra operations. And all of a sudden, you had a very powerful coprocessor that could take advantage um, uh, of, um, uh, of massively paralyzing uh, the linear algebra operations. Uh, the second was that uh, convolutional filters uh, that, um, you know, had existed since like the uh, 80s, um, but uh, they became uh, sort of resurfaced. Um, and what uh, at the time was sort of a theoretical concept could actually be uh, uh, plugged into, uh, uh, into practical use. Um, and the reason why these were so powerful is that they were able to take advantage of the local covariance between pixels um, in, and so they 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 were spatially aware um, uh, 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 neurons. 
The third was the use of nonlinear activation functions uh, that could get around what was known as the vanishing gradient problem. And then finally, like I mentioned, our uh, hardware um, architecture had evolved to a point where we were able to collect and collate um, you know, large data sets. Uh, and it, when you put all these things together, we live in a very exciting time where, you know, as you have more data um, and you have the capacity, the compute capacity to um, train these uh, large models, the performance just seems to increase and increase. And even, you know, today with things like ChatGPT, it's really quite remarkable uh, what these models are capable of. Um, so, you know, Hopefully, uh, that sort of gives you a little bit of an introduction uh, to uh, AI. Uh, but often, uh, when I'm speaking to a crowd that's not that familiar with um, ophthalmology, I'd like to show, you know, the, build sort of a case for why I think um, ophthalmology in particular uh, is such a, a nice fit uh, for, um, you know, uh, AI research. Um, first, you know, there's sort of a, a, a critical need of ophthalmologists. And if you take, um, uh, this is a survey that was done in the United States, uh, where uh, they asked a, a diverse uh, group of, of, of people, you know, what they were sort of most uh, afraid of um, uh, that would affect their, you know, day to day life and losing eyesight was uh, first on this list. Uh, and then if you ask them, you know, to rank the worst conditions that they could imagine having, uh, blindness actually ranked um, as high as cancer or, or Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so people really care about not going blind. Um, and then if you think about, like, why deep learning and ophthalmology, um, the ophthalmic exam uh, is actually encoded in electronic medical records um, in very structured fields. Uh, so the exam for, you know, what the cornea looks like uh, lives uh, in one text box. Um, and then what the exam for the uh, uh, right eye retina um, looks like lives in a, a totally different text box. Um, and so uh, it's not just a, a whole bunch of unstructured text uh, like you see in radiology or pathology. Uh, we actually have vast volumes of imaging data, uh, arguably more than even, you know, uh, pathology or radiology, uh, just by the sheer number of uh, patients uh, that we see. Um, and then uh, there's sort of this need for synchronous real-time expert interpretation. So, well, one thing that happens in these other medical fields is that, you know, the images are captured at one setting, and then the expert looks at them and reviews, reviews them at a different setting and then gives a report. And so there's sort of an asynchronous nature uh, to how the, uh, the workload is distributed. Uh, but in, um, in ophthalmology, when we see the patients in the clinic, uh, there's only uh, seconds to minutes before uh, the images become available that the clinician needs to review it uh, and then make a medical decision. Um, and with the aging population in the world, it's rapidly sort of outstripping um, the supply of doctors that can uh, do that kind of uh, real-time expert interpretation. Um, and so there's the, this is another area why I think um, you know, deep learning has really made a, a huge impact in the field of ophthalmology. Uh, it's really important to understand um, certain forms of uh, imaging that's available. Um, there's something known as optical coherence tomography, um, and it gives an image uh, that sort of looks like this. This is a cross section of the uh, macula where the, the, this is the optic nerve over here, and this is the fovea in the center. Um, and what I would uh, argue is that uh, there's a much more information dense uh, um, uh, uh, imaging uh, compared to a uh, color fundus photograph. Uh, so when people who are not in the field um, of, uh, of ophthalmology think about what we do on a daily basis, they assume that we capture a lot of these kinds of images on the right, uh, but actually we rarely collect these. Uh, we, we almost always collect an OCT uh, uh, because it shows us things that we, uh, the human eye cannot see. Uh, but the color fundus photograph is, is simply sort of a, a, a record of what we see when we look in somebody's eye. Um, and OCT is fairly remarkable in that uh, it allows us uh, non-invasively to see almost microscopic level detail. Um, so this is the histology slide uh, of, the, of the retina, uh, of the human retina, and you can see almost the same layers and the striations of the um, OCT itself. Um, and so you, this is one of the reasons why it gives us a level of detail uh, that was, um, you know, impossible to see uh, before. Uh, so here's, uh, you know, an example OCT um, uh, from somebody in the clinic uh, where 
it's sort of like a CT scan where it's a volumetric scan uh, of the macula. Uh, and uh, it kind of gives us um, a cross section uh, through each uh, location where the B scan is captured. Uh, so the, the main uh, uh, pros of this uh, imaging modality is that it's non-invasive. Um, it only takes a minute uh, to capture and it provides this microscopic detail. Um, and it, it, be, it is definitely the most commonly obtained ocular imaging modality. Um, uh, this is just from, you know, the Medicare data set uh, from 2012 to 2014. Uh, there were, you know, uh, all, more than 5 million um, uh, scans captured in one year. Um, and so that sort of sets us up uh, for, uh, you know, what, um, how we sort of got started in this, uh, um, uh, in this, uh, um, uh, in deep learning. Uh, because what happened was that uh, when I arrived at University of Washington, one of the first things I did uh, was extract um, all the OCT imaging that was uh, available at our institution. Um, and it uh, amounted uh, to, at the time, uh, to about, you know, 4 million OCT uh, images. Um, and uh, because I had access to the um, uh, SQL databases that drive the EMR at our institution, I could match and uh, pair each one of the OCTs with things like the visual acuity, the, the uh, 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 clinical diagnosis, and what interventions uh, happened around that time. Um, and so one of the very first um, uh, projects that we did um, uh, was uh, to ask uh, what I thought was a very uh, fairly simple question. Um, you know, could deep learning uh, 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 learn to distinguish, um, you know, normal OCT images uh, from uh, OCT images uh, from a, a, a disease known as age-related macular degeneration or, or AMD? Um, and so we, uh, from our data set, we collected a, a approximately, you know, 100,000 images uh, where there were about you know, 50,000 normals and 50,000 uh, macular degeneration uh, B scans. Um, and we trained a, a state-of-the-art model at the time known as uh, VGG16, uh, and we trained it from scratch. Um, so this is sort of the model architecture uh, that we used. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this was uh, two days later um, uh, and sort of our first, you know, real deep learning experiment. Um, I was completely blown away by these results. Uh, so we achieved, you know, uh, AUROCs that were above uh, 90 percent um, uh, at the single image level. And then if you collected them across the patients, um, uh, it, then it was uh, reaching around, you know, 97 percent uh, area under the curve with peak, a very high peak sensitivities and specificities. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, deep learning papers in ophthalmology were uh, very scarce. Um, and so this was one of the very first um, uh, 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 research results. Uh, and I was uh, actually quite nervous about publishing this uh, because it almost seemed, you know, too good to be true. And it was, and I was new to the field of deep learning. Well, we all were. Um, and I, I wasn't sure whether, you know, I had done something wrong or the model was cheating somehow. Um, and so I, 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 I was actually a little bit nervous to, to publish this. Um, and that sort of gets uh, into this problem that we are pretty familiar with today and that these models are fairly, you know, black boxes uh, that we can't really understand exactly how uh, the model works or how it's making its decisions. Um, so, um, you know, uh, one of the, I dug around the computer vision literature and I found uh, this technique um, that, uh, you know, I actually still sort of use today, uh, even though there are more advanced techniques available. And one of the reasons is because it's still, it's quite intuitive. Uh, so the way it works is that if I, you know, give you this picture and I ask you, is there a ball in this picture? You would say with 100% certainty, yes, there is a ball in this picture. Uh, but if I cover up a part of the picture uh, and uh, I ask you this question again, uh, and I vary the position um, of this uh, of this box, uh, uh, and I keep asking you, you know, is there a ball in this picture? Eventually, the box will end up here, uh, and I will ask you, uh, is there a ball in this picture? And you'll say, I'm not sure. Um, and so that's uh, sort of a post hoc, you know, occlusion based uh, method uh, for interrogating deep learning models. Uh, so what we did is we took uh, images uh, from uh, the test set. Uh, where, um, you know, the, the model had not been directly trained on. Uh, and we um, uh, systematically applied uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, occlusion to every pixel position on the uh, scan. And we looked to see what happened uh, to the model confidence in calling this uh, macular degeneration. Uh, but, and by taking the, you know, the difference uh, in its confidence 
from the original baseline, uh, we could generate sort of a heat map. Um, and when we generated this heat map, it looked like this. Um, and uh, so this is sort of highlighting uh, areas um, uh, that are well known uh, to be uh, um, uh, involved uh, in the diagnosis of age-related macular degeneration. And that gave me a lot more confidence uh, that the model was actually doing something, you know, useful. Uh, it wasn't cheating uh, somehow. Um, and, and so this uh, is sort of what led to our first paper uh, in deep learning. Uh, so it was very clear um, that uh, to me that um, after that result, um, uh, that deep learning really uh, was um, very, very powerful. And that was, it was probably, you know, sort of here to stay. Um, uh, it was going to sort of impact the way that we do research. Um, so I started thinking uh, beyond this, and I want to give, um, you know, one example uh, of, um, uh, of where, uh, you know, we are trying to use deep learning uh, to understand diseases better um, and uh, ex uh, supercharge, you know, existing uh, clinical tools uh, that we have available in the clinic today. Uh, so this is um, uh, a paper and a project uh, that um, our group did in very close collaboration uh, with David Krapp's group um, at, at City University. Um, and uh, this was a, a paper that was published uh, in the journal Ophthalmology, um, where it goes into sort of, you know, very excruciating detail about what exactly we did. But uh, I'll kind of give you a highlight of what we we're trying to do. The overall idea is, um, you know, is there some way that we could use uh, deep learning uh, to uh, understand how the visual field is set up um, from uh, structural imaging? Uh, and so um, it, this is in a disease no, sort of uh, known as glaucoma, uh, where normally we take, um, you know, visual field, uh, Humphrey visual fields um, uh, to un understand what, how the peripheral vision is uh, def um, uh, deficient. Uh, but this is a psychophysical test uh, that has a lot of noise associated with it. Um, in comparison at the sort of routine clinical care, we'll, we'll usually also obtain uh, an OCT image uh, of the optic nerve uh, to see what's happening to the structural components um, of the uh, retinal neurofiber layer that drives the peripheral vision. Um, and so we um, uh, worked together with uh, several different um, uh, um, uh, uh, several different NHS trusts uh, in England uh, to co collate a data set that had about uh, you know 11,000 pairs of, of visual fields uh, with OCTs, uh, and then we kept a held out uh, test set. Um, and we trained um, you know, sort of two, uh, actually three models. Um, one model. Uh, took an image uh, of the optic disc uh, and then tried to predict um, every point on the uh, Humphrey visual field. So there's uh, 54 points on a Humphrey visual field. Um, and what we're trying to do is take this image and predict how the patient at that time would have done on the psychophysical test, where they have to click a button when they see a, a light uh, in a certain location in their visual field. Um, and then uh, we also took another model that took the circular um, OCTB scan and again, tried to do this task of, uh, of predicting um, every point on the 24-2. Finally, uh, we trained a policy model uh, that took the two predictions uh, from, the, from these two different models uh, and tried to um, uh, predict uh, you know, which one to use at each point uh, in the visual field. So, you know, the, the, the job of this model is to look at the outputs of the two underlying models and decide, you know, I think I should use at this point, you know, the, uh, the prediction from the disk model versus the OCT model. Um, and, uh, and then it would copy that, uh, um, uh, copy that value forward. Uh, so this is a busy slide, so I'll kind of go through it and hopefully it'll uh, kind of uh, um, make it a little bit more clear what exactly um, uh, I'm talking about here. So this is an IR uh, image of the optic disc, uh, and this is the input into one of the models. Uh, and then this is a circular uh, B scan where it's a, a B scan that was taken in a circular fashion around the optic disc, um, but then flattened into a two dimensional image. Uh, and so this uh, has sort of a topologic uh, a feature where, you know, this side of the image is the temporal uh, part of the disc. This is superior, this is uh, the nasal, this is the inferior part, and then this is back to temporal because it wraps around to this side. Um, and then uh, this is the, um, you know, uh, output of a Humphrey visual field uh, where um, each point um, represents a, a point in, uh, within a certain amount of eccentricity uh, from the foveal fixation. 
um, and it's covering about you know 24 uh, degrees um, on uh, each side uh, of the visual field. And, and these numbers represent how how many decibels of light uh, the the the, uh, the person was able to see. Um, and so here, these uh, areas that are zero uh, means that the the patient's actually not able to see anything in that location of their visual field at all. Um, and so the job of these uh, models is to take you know this image and then predict uh, you know basically um, each one of these points. Um, and so you can see uh, down here. This is the output of the disk uh, model uh, that took this image and tried to predict uh, the 24-2. Uh, and then here you can see the output of the OCT model uh, that tried to take you know, this image and predict uh, every point on the 24-2. Uh, and then this is the policy model uh, that's trying to decide whether I uh, the model should take uh, the prediction at any given point uh, from uh, the disk or from uh, the OCT image. And so what you can see here is that if the circles are uh, red, uh, then it would copy the um, uh, the uh, prediction from the OCT model. And if they were blue, uh, then they would copy the predictions uh, from the disk model. Um, and so it creates a sort of a fusion of the uh, of the two predictions uh, in the lower right. Um, and what we showed uh, in the paper is that in the test set, you know, the disk model actually performed the worst. Uh, the OCT model uh, performed better, uh, and then if you combined it to the policy model, uh, did uh, the best. Um, but you know, I think uh, one of the cool things about this project um, is this again this post hoc uh, occlusion test that we did. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'll play this movie, and so you're watching what happens uh, to the prediction uh, as it occludes uh, different parts of the disk. Um, and so uh, what's really neat to see over here. Uh, is that you know when you include a certain part of the optic disc, it's re, um, it's it's showing that it it, belie it believes that the uh, the the disc uh, should have a deficit in certain areas, uh, and the same thing was happening for the OCT over here. Um, and what's really neat about this is that it 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 actually um, uh, uh, recapitulated sort of you know how clinicians sort of grossly understand the topology of the um, uh, of the optic disc. Uh, so we wanted to show this more formally, um, and so what we did is uh, we came up with this method of uh, trying to understand um, at every point in the 24-2, uh, how does uh, what part of the optic disc uh, was uh, most influential uh, for um, affecting that point uh, in the in, uh, using this post hoc occlusion method uh, you, um, uh, systematically uh, in the test set. And by doing that, uh, we could generate uh, this uh, figure uh, where um, you're able to see in red here uh, the uh, in polar coordinate system, sort of where the model uh, believed would um, uh, would be mapped uh, to um, uh, to affecting this particular position uh, in the 24-2. Um, and what's being shown uh, in these other um, uh, colors is a sort of the state of the art, um, a human understanding of where the topology uh, of the visual field matches the anatomic um, relationship. Um, and what's, uh, what's you know, kind of um, um, amazing is that uh, what, how the humans sort of did this, or the, uh, the clinical experts did this, is that they painstakingly tried to understand uh, the distribution of the retinal fiber layer arcs and how that would match uh, with uh, the visual field. Um, and so it's kind of amazing that uh, this the, this uh, deep learning approach uh, was able to do this in com in a completely data driven uh, fashion to back out uh, you know the ac anatomic structure function relationship uh, of the optic disc. Um, I do want to uh, uh, kind of talk about some of the uh, most recent projects we published um, uh, along with uh, a new project that we're heading up uh, uh, as uh, for with the last um, uh, part of my talk. Uh, so uh, there's a, a a project that we believed was, you know, one of the things that I've been uh, wanting to solve since ever since getting started in this field. Uh, and it's something that I sort of call the last mile problem uh, with AI and um, uh, uh, and clinical imaging. Um, and so, you know, hopefully uh, all of you know that uh, when you train AI models, it often requires large data sets with a variety of pathology and different phenotypes. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the current state of the art models are very much dependent uh, on the imaging instrument that was used uh, in the training set. Um, and uh, this is because these models are very sensitive uh, to this uh, distribution of the input signal. 
Um, and uh, so if you imagine like a new OCT machine becoming available on the market today, uh, it might take, you know, two to five years to collect uh, enough data. Uh, and then it might take another one to two years to annotate that data um, uh, by, uh, by human uh, clinical experts. Uh, and then it might take another one to two years to train, you know, a state-of-the-art AI model. And then uh, two to three years to externally validate um, that model in, you know, say like a prospective uh, data set. Um, uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, go for regulatory approval, and then by that time, you know the uh, you know we're talking about you know uh, you know uh, almost eight to ten years. Uh, that instrument may be obsolete. So how are we ever going to develop AI tools um, uh, for uh, you know uh, to keep up with the cycle of innovation that's occurring uh, with uh, uh, new optical devices? Um, and so um, we wanted to try and tackle this problem. So I just want to sort of show, you know, uh, uh, what I mean by uh, this particular uh, uh, problem being a, a real big issue. So here, um, you know, if you have o OCT images uh, from one manufacturer and you train a deep learning model and then you try uh, to solve this seven layer segmentation problem of each of the layers um, uh, of, the, uh, of the retina and then also annotate uh, the areas of the intraretinal fluid. Um, you can get that usually working uh, uh, fairly well with one manufacturer. But then if you take that same model and you apply it to uh, OCT images from a different manufacturer uh, without retraining it, um, it will perform uh, usually uh, disastrously. So this is uh, you know, completely wrong um, uh, and it doesn't uh, obey the topology of the retina and it doesn't uh, know what to do in the center here at all. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, basically a failure to generalize uh, to a different instrument. Um, and so we wanted to know, is there any uh, way that we could use data from existing devices to work on new devices without annotations from that new device? Um, and so we found uh, this great data set that was um, uh, open sourced uh, by Sino Farsu's group at Duke, where they had a data set of about 110 B scans manually annotated uh, for intraretinal fluid ND seven layers. And then we took about 1500 B scans uh, that were randomly selected from the UK Biobank uh, with the Talcon 1000 device uh, where we had no human uh, annotations. Um, and then we you know, constructed a test set of about 100 B scans from both the Topcon and the Heidelberg device. And Moorfields Eye Hospital uh, actually provided multi-grader uh, pixel-wise annotations uh, for these you know, seven layers um, and, and the intraretinal fluid. Um, and we uh, uh, took advantage of uh, something that was happening in the computer vision uh, uh, literature uh, that uh, takes a, uh, that tries to do a domain uh, transfer, a transformation. Um, and so uh, this is a model known as you get it. Um, and basically, uh, it, it was given the task of taking pictures of cats and trying to turn them into dogs, uh, horses into zebras, you know, and pictures of, uh, of people uh, into anime characters. Um, so, you know, not exactly the most useful um, uh, uh, use, in my opinion, of, uh, of GPU time, but um, it definitely, you know, very impressive results. Um, and so what we tried to do uh, was to see if we could use this uh, in, our, uh, to, uh, in our problems uh, setting. Uh, so a little bit more formally, so um, in the traditional deep learning segmentation setup, uh, you have an image A, you have a deep learning model, usually a UNET uh, U, uh, and then you pass, you know, the image through this model and you get this prediction, uh, U of A. Um, and then on the other side, you'll have the human annotation label. Um, uh, uh, and what we'll usually do is compute a loss function of the difference between the prediction and the ground truth. Uh, and then we'll, you know, backprop uh, this against this model and try to adjust um, uh, the model parameters to minimize this loss. Uh, so that's sort of the traditional deep learning setup. Uh, what we tried to do was use the UGADIT uh, system uh, on this side. There's actually the UGADIT uh, architecture is quite complex. So this is only showing, you know, uh, one tenth of it really. Uh, but what we tried to do was take images where we had the human annotation. So domain A is the Heidelberg images uh, where we have the Heidelberg uh, labels on the other side. And we would pass them through the UGADIT to generate uh, images in the style of uh, the Topcon 1000 uh, device. Uh, and then back into uh, into the Heidelberg device. And we pass these three um, into the same unit model uh, and generate three different uh, predictions and enforce uh, that the uh, the model needs to, 
you know, uh, learn to do this task in all the domains. Um, in, in addition, uh, one thing that's really important to realize is that the, these lost terms are actually uh, backpropped against all the way to the you get it side. So the generator also has to generate these images in a fashion that would keep the pathology in the same place in order to allow the unit to do its job. Um, and we believe that that was one of the key things that allowed uh, uh, our project to sort of work. Uh, so here are some, you know, formal metrics um, where we have the dice. We have the two domains here, so Heidelberg and the Talkon 1000. Our model uh, we called Genseg M, which is shown in this sort of dark blue. And then we have the traditional unit uh, in green here. And what you can see, you know, uh, already with just, just these first few layers uh, is that the, the green bar um, is doing quite well against uh, the human um, uh, interhuman uh, variants uh, that's shown uh, in these sort of first, you know, light color uh, bars. Um, uh, but when you compare them uh, in the Talkon 1000 uh, domain, uh, they actually fail, you know, catastrophically. Uh, but again, like M is able to kind of keep up with the human uh, interhuman variants. Uh, and this is true sort of across all the different uh, layers of the retina. Uh, we showed uh, that the Gensec M is actually able to keep up um, uh, in most uh, for most pathology, sorry, most layers of the retina uh, with the interhuman um, experts uh, in the Talcon 1000 uh, domain. Uh, and just to reinforce, you know, we did not have any labels when we we're training this uh, uh, in the Talcon 1000 device. Uh, uh, so here uh, is, you know, uh, some pictorial examples in the test set. Uh, where we have, you know, the two uh, human graders. Uh, for Heidelberg, we had the Duke original uh, annotations as well as the Moorfield annotations. Uh, and we have the Gansek M uh, results as well as the uh, traditionally trained UNET results. Um, and then uh, in the Talcom 1000 um, uh, domain, we showed, you know, that the model is actually able to generalize uh, to this uh, 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 images, whereas the tra tra traditional UNET uh, failed. Um, uh, but, you know, there was actually more, uh, and this is where, you know, we were really uh, kind of shocked and surprised. Um, we took uh, uh, devices uh, that was made by uh, Topcon, the same manufacturer, Top, uh, you know, Topcon 1000 is actually a very old OCT uh, machine, and the Meister 2 is a much more um, uh, new OCT machine. And we wanted to just see how it might work, uh, even without retraining the model at all. So here the model had not seen any uh, uh, Topcon Meister 2 images uh, in uh, any domain uh, during training. And we just tried it uh, with inference at test time. Uh, and the model's actually able to do a, 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 a decent job here. And even more impressively, um, we, uh, we went to a third manufacturer. Uh, Zeiss was not part of either domain uh, during training. Um, and the Plex Elite is actually a, a, a different kind of OCT machine altogether. It's a swept source OCT machine. Whereas everything I showed you uh, up until this point were spectral domain OCTs, and yet the model is still uh, able to uh, do this segmentation task. Um, so this is quite, you know, uh, uh, surprising and amazing. Uh, and if you want to learn more, you know, this is a paper that we was just published um, uh, uh, in the fall of last year uh, in ophthalmology that uh, goes into a lot more detail. Um, I do want to end by talking about uh, this NIH project that we're heading up. Uh, we, uh, you know, as our lab has uh, over the years done um, a lot of deep learning projects, we sort of realized uh, that there is a critical um, uh, need uh, for more data sets that are sufficiently powered to do deep learning. Um, and so uh, we were fortunate enough to get one of the uh, NIH Bridge to AI uh, grants uh, to, um, uh, to, to take on this uh, uh, project. So the purpose of our, um, uh, of our project is to create a uh, um, multi-dimensional ethically sourced data set in diverse people for studying salutogenesis in type two diabetes. Uh, and if you never sort of heard the term salutogenesis before, um, it, it's uh, sort of uh, easy to think about in this sort of framework. So uh, in biomedical research, we spend a lot of time thinking about how uh, diseases uh, go from healthy state to disease state. And we think about risk factors like you know, environmental genetic and behavioral that head us down this pathway. Um, and this is a main, the main focus of a lot of biomedical research. Uh, but we rarely think about the reverse of this. Um, um, that's known as salutogenesis, uh, where we try to return uh, back to a healthy state. Or how do we encourage the body to go back to a healthy state? 
Um, and so we proposed uh, to collect a data set uh, that could, you know, study not only salutogenesis, uh, um, uh, but, but also both sides of this uh, uh, sort of uh, dynamic. Um, this project is uh, very large. Uh, it, uh, it spans, you know, seven or eight different institutions uh, and is broken up into these sort of six modules. Uh, where a group um, from Stanford is going to be leading the team science uh, section of the uh, of this project, uh, the uh, group at UCSD uh, with Sally Baxter and Linda Zengwell uh, will be leading up the skills and workforce development. Um, a group from you know the Johns Hopkins and UCSD uh, will be looking at the ethics of doing uh, AI research and collecting this type of data. Uh, there's a group um, at Calmi and OHSU that will be building uh, an open source. Uh, a tool set uh, to transform, you know, raw data into a standard format. Um, and then uh, there's the data itself that will be uh, collected, led by Cynthia Owsley uh, and uh, Jerry McGuinn at UAB, uh, that will collect, uh, you know, this uh, uh, large data set. And then uh, there's a group, uh, you know, led by Christopher Shute at Johns Hopkins and myself uh, at UW that's trying to uh, build standards that where they don't exist uh, to harmonize and um, uh, and uh, collate this data set. Uh, so what is uh, what are we actually collecting? Uh, well, again, we're targeting type two diabetes. And one of the things that we've noticed uh, in medical data sets uh, in general is that they're either very enriched for disease or they're very enriched for normals and they're not uniformly distributed. And, and so we, uh, um, with type two diabetes, we intentionally uh, uh, stratified into these sort of four groups of no diabetes at all, lifestyle controlled, oral medication controlled, and insulin uh, dependent. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is actually construct a triple balanced data set where a thousand of the participants uh, will be white, a thousand black, a thousand Asian American, and a thousand Hispanic. Uh, and then within this group, uh, you know, there will be a, a uniform sampling for these four different axes of diabetes severity. And then within that, there'll be one-to-one -one balancing of uh, males and females. Um, and so, uh, you know, these, uh, there'll be sort of three data collection sites uh, where we'll be collecting this, uh, 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 this clinical data. And the idea, overall, the idea behind uh, this sort of a balancing of gender and race is that if somebody used this data set to train a deep learning model, uh, then at, at the very least, um, it will hopefully not be biased uh, against any one of these uh, four racial ethnic groups or against uh, gender. Uh, we even have sort of a reach goal of working with uh, uh, an American Indian tribe um, uh, to um, uh, to uh, 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 for this uh, uh, for this data set collection efforts. Uh, so the data itself, um, you know, will obviously have a medical history. We'll collect uh, demographics and vitals. Uh, we'll uh, collect a whole bunch of different uh, 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 blood work uh, and urine markers. Uh, we'll collect surveys of social determinants of health as well as uh, depression. Uh, we'll do a battery of cognitive function tests. Uh, we'll collect a 12 lead EKG. Um, we'll uh, also do, you know, visual function tests uh, like, um, you know, Snell and visual acuity as well as contrast sensitivity. Uh, and then we'll collect a whole bunch of different ophthalmic imaging, including color fundus photos, OCT, OCTA, and a very new modality known as FLEO. Uh, for these first three modalities, we're actually capturing them on you know, three different uh, uh, cameras uh, to try and solve this uh, um, you know, uh, intermachine, uh, sorry, single machine uh, dependence problem of AI models. Uh, we also plan to send participants home for about you know, seven, to, seven to 10 days where they'll be wearing a continuous glucose monitor as well as um, uh, a Apple Watch uh, to um, uh, monitor their activity and heart rate. Um, we'll, uh, we built a small a custom, you know, environmental sensing device that can measure the air quality inside of each one of um, uh, their homes. Uh, and then we hope to do some kind of sequencing as well as banking of iPSC cells um, and uh, serum and plasma uh, in um, a biobank at, uh, at UAB. And the most, uh, you know, in my opinion, the most exciting part and transformative part of this uh, effort is that we hope uh, and plan to open source this data set uh, so that, you know, there's not going to be a DUA that you need to sign. Uh, there will not be a data access committee uh, for the public portion of this data set. Uh, anybody with uh, internet connection uh, will be able to kind of download uh, and use this data set. Uh, we actually plan to, you know, make it um, a, com a commercial friendly 
um, uh, open source license uh, to help stimulate and drive the field forward. Um, I just want to end uh, by, you know, I, I love this idea of mathematical and computational ophthalmology being um, uh, sort of a new field. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, Paul Roberts uh, and uh, others are sort of spearheading uh, this special issue at IOBS, uh, because um, I, I do think that it is going to be uh, 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 a, a new way of doing research uh, in our field. And I, I, you know, this overall idea of doing data science um, in uh, uh, in the you know the vision science world, um, I, I think has a very bright future because uh, uh, Michael Chang is now the director of the National Eye Institute, and Michael Chang is known for many things, but um, he uh, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, uh, but he uh, is actually quite uh, famous as a, a informatician, uh, as well as being uh, one of the first to develop uh, deep learning models for. Um, uh, a condition known as retinopathy of prematurity uh, in uh, um, premature babies. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, this is sort of the dawn of a new sort of er era of research uh, in our field. And so I just want to end by, you know, thanking all the members of my lab. A lot of the work that I showed uh, today is uh, really the work um, uh, of the people uh, in our group, uh, as well as uh, all the uh, uh, funding sources. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Well, uh, thanks, Aaron, for a really wonderful, uh, fascinating talk. Um, I, uh, I'm sure uh, those uh, online enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, so we've got a few questions have um, come through. And, and so do please, uh, if you, uh, you can continue asking questions as I ask these to, to, to Aaron now. So, so the first question uh, here is from uh, Miranda Lynch. And she asks, are there repositories or public databases of these OCT images and perhaps with associated metadata that this would be a remarkable resource for image analysis methods development? So, um, yes, so uh, there are actually a couple open source repositories uh, that have OCT images. Um, uh, one is actually hosted on Kaggle, uh, so you can actually go on Kaggle and download uh, a data set. It's, it's uh, fairly substantial. Uh, and it was a data set that was used in uh, uh, one of the early papers um, uh, that was published in the journal Cell. Um, uh, so uh, that uh, data set is definitely one that you could play with. Um, it, the only labels attached to it are uh, four disease categories, um, and but it is still one that could be used. Uh, uh, the, the other um, sort of data set that I'll point to is the one that we used in our paper um, uh, that was uh, open sourced by Sino Farsu's group. Um, that also uh, is available along with the human annotations uh, of the different uh, segmentation layers. Um, and then finally, of course, you know, the, the data set that we plan to release uh, to the world uh, is hopefully one that will uh, bring a lot of data scientists to our field. Um, we plan to actually release it on sort of a yearly schedule, so you, you won't have to hold your breath for four years uh, before the data set is out there. Uh, we do plan to release it um, as early as you know, the summer of next year. Wonderful. Um, and, and there's a second question here from Miranda. So she also asks, so this was, um, and we're looking at the occluding disc stuff. So I presume the size of the occluding disc strongly impacts how these prediction assessments turn out. How was the size of the removed information chosen? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and it, it, it gets at to uh, it, probably the biggest weakness with the occlusion based methods. Uh, is that you have to um, sort of uh, a priori choose uh, a, a mask size to use. Um, and so, you know, we used uh, a mask size uh, that, you know, we believe would sort of uh, be reasonable uh, to occlude different parts of the disk without occluding, you know, the entire disk at any one point. Um, the, um, uh, the advantage of some of the, um, so the, the other sort of weakness of the occlusion-based methods is, it is, that, is that they're very computationally expensive. Uh, you basically have to run inference uh, through every pixel position of that disk uh, through your model. Um, there are more elegant solutions uh, for doing post hoc uh, um, uh, analysis like integrated gradients or GradCam and you know, these other uh, type of methods. Um, but in our experience, um, the occlusion-based methods uh, seem to be sort of the most robust uh, out of the postdoc analyses. So it's one of the reasons that we still use them today. 
Thanks. Uh, and so we've got a question here. I, I do apologize if, I, if I'm mispronouncing this name. So this is uh, Louis D. Cisternas. And he says, thanks, Aaron, for this great talk. Uh, can you speak about the challenge of putting structured and unstructured data from different nature together to solve complex problems in ophthalmology? And then he says, is this a problem that is currently solved with current models and approaches or a next revolution? Yeah, it's a good uh, question. So. Um... I, I, I do think that um, it, this is uh, one of these sort of unsolved, currently unsolved problems um, in that, you know, on one side uh, from the clinical notes, uh, we have a lot of unstructured data. It, it, in my opinion, you know, in ophthalmology, it's semi-structured uh, where, you know, the, there again is a sort of a text box for the uh, exam of the cornea of the right eye. Uh, and a different text box um, uh, for the retina of the uh, left eye. Uh, but it, um, you know, it, in some EHRs, that's completely structured in that you can only pick certain values to go into that field. And in other EHRs, people can just type whatever the heck they want. Um, and so uh, uh, it is um, one of the problems of trying to figure out how to um, uh, understand uh, and extract that data to use as clinical labels. Uh, for, um, you know, for uh, doing deep learning research. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of promise uh, with uh, what's happening in the uh, uh, natural language um, uh, processing space. Uh, it used to be that NLP was sort of this um, sort of uh, went from sort of rule based methods to, uh, you know, some machine learning based methods. And now it's like firmly planted in deep learning now as the state of the art. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, using those family of models, uh, we can either use the language vector um, uh, uh, to, under, to semantically capture the meaning of uh, certain parts of uh, clinical text uh, and use that as a training label or use that as a, uh, as a, um, as a instance, training instance, or um, uh, use these models actually to take, uh, transform unstructured data and, and into a completely structured form. Uh, so it is, um, you know, uh, you know, I like Luis's, uh, Luis's uh, description of the next revolution. Uh, I, I do think that might be um, one way to think about it. Uh, wonderful. Thanks, Aaron. Um, but I haven't got any other questions from, from online at the moment, although I think there is still time if you want to type any more. Perhaps I might just ask a, a question of my own. So um, I, I guess I, uh, it'd be interesting to know to what extent are AI methods being used in, op uh, in a clinical practice in ophthalmology at the moment? Is that is that something that's mostly in the future or are there instances where it's currently being used? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, is that, um, you know, the there's uh, uh, ophthalmology is actually is sort of leading the charge in terms of um, of AI adoption in, in medicine. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, um, there was a, a device um, known as uh, IDXDR uh, that was um, uh, spearheaded by somebody named I uh, Michael Abramoff, who uh, got through, you know, sort of trailblazed um, a, a 510k process of a fully automated diagnostic device. Um, so this is a you know, a, a classification model under the hood uh, that uh, takes an image of the uh, of the retina and then it can tell the physician whether that person needs to see an eye doctor or not. Um, and this is aimed at sort of primary care doctors uh, who are not, uh, you know, clinical experts in ophthalmology um, so that they can, you know, empower them to be able to divert the right people who, who have diabetes um, uh, to see a, an ophthalmologist versus not. And uh, there's no human in the loop. Um, and so these models are running in, in camera systems uh, today uh, uh, um, uh, in the United States, um, as well as around the world, uh, where uh, they are making medical decisions completely on their own. Um, and so it, that the first time that's ever happened in the entire field of medicine was uh, in our field. Um, and, and so, yes, there are actually now, um, I believe, like three FDA approved devices that are completely autonomous, making clinical decisions on their own. So that's one family of AI models. There's a whole host of other AI models that I believe are being used for image processing uh, inside of these you know, uh, devices because they're so powerful at solving some of these um, uh, traditional uh, uh, computer vision problems uh, in, our, in our space. And so uh, I do think uh, you know, these, device, these out family of algorithms are, are starting to you know, permeate throughout um, every level of care uh, in, in our field. Oh, wonderful. That's exciting to hear, and particularly to hear that ophthalmology is leading, leading the charge there.
Yeah, no, no, no. It, it is very, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, attention outside of the field of ophthalmology being sort of uh, put on our field because of uh, this rapid innovation that's occurring. Wonderful. Um, well, I think I see I'm looking at the time. So I think we'll make that um, the last question. So uh, it just remains for me to um, thank Aaron again for a really wonderful talk and for your time um, in, in thoughtful answers to each of those questions. Um, I'd like to just uh, say that our next seminar uh, to be is going to be given by Anna Pandolfi on the topic of computational models and experimental methods for the human cornea and that will be broadcast live at 1 p.m british summer time on tuesday the 2nd of may and this will be followed by Tian and keenan on the topic of diverse applications of artificial intelligence and mathematical mathematical approaches in ophthalmology and that will be broadcast live at 3 p.m british summer time on tuesday the 6th of june Further details of all future talks can be found on our worldwide page, the link to which can be found in the About section of this YouTube channel. And do also subscribe to this YouTube channel if you'd like to keep up to date on past and future talks. Thanks again to Aaron, uh, thanks to you for listening, and see you next time on Mathematical and Computational Ophthalmology. Goodbye. <laughs>